Hi, I'm Peggy at Headshots by Peggy, and today the award-winning Merrick McCartha is going to co-host with me as we have the legendary Bill Duke with us. He's an actor, director, writer, poet. Is there anything that you don't do? Accountant. He's not an accountant, there you go. <laughs> Your experience too with uh, coming up in Hollywood was dealing with discrimination a lot, even as director, which blows me away. Yes. That uh, and you, you know, famously you talk about your experience with going to direct uh, Dallas. Yes. Which uh, at the time was the top show on television. The top show. You did. You, who was out? Jr. was like it a was, national movement. It was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for you to show up and a guard to. His first question to you was, who are you delivering to? Who, 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 are, de who are you delivering for? Yeah, who are you delivering for? Um, and I imagine you didn't pull up in a, you know, in a... I had a, a decent little, car. <laughs> I was going to say, you didn't pull up in a... I had a jacket meter. and a tie, a briefcase wow. I just bought to impress yeah. everybody. Yeah. And he's, I rolled the window down. Before I could speak, he said, um, who are you delivering for? And I wanted to say to him... I'm thinking about delivering a can of whip ass to you. I didn't say that. <laughs> you didn't say that. No, I felt it. But the night before, I watched Dr. King mm. in a speech mm -hmm. uh, that was taped. And I took a breath and I said, I'm delivering my talent as the first black director on Dallas. Could you please open the gate? Mm. Mm. The most rewarding thing was the gasp mm. in, that he took. See, that was... Right. Yeah. I, I was satisfied by that. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to that, you had directed, I think, Falcon Crest before that. And Knots somebody, Landing. Knots Landing. Things, yeah. Uh, I think uh, several things. And you even wrote, I, I think you wrote for uh, Good Times, at least, or mm -hmm. something. Did something for Good Times? Oh, yes. And that show, too, dealt with this thing we talked about with poverty and the messaging of their circumstances. And their Good Times gets a lot of flack for having a negative message as well. What are your thoughts on that whole situation? I thought it was truthful, you know, mm -hmm. negative messages and good messages, but we were going through good and bad things at those times, you know. And mm -hmm. It was one of the first shows, other than the Cosby Show, to examine real black families, you know, not mm -hmm. as buffoons or something, just mm -hmm. yuck yucking but human issues, right. and we were not perfect. Right. We were not perfect people, but we were human people. And that's what I was encouraged by, to see those shows, you know? Yeah. Um, there was some comedy to it, yes, but also a lot of it dealt with, hmm, hmm. mother and father issues, husband and wife issues, yeah. you know? Um, and, um, and prior to that, there were, I think you grew up with the, uh, the step and fetch it and the the Amos and Andy, which were funny shows, however, <laughs> the, the depiction of black people was... Uh... But do you know that Stephen Fetchett was one of the first black millionaires in this country? How about that? Do you know that he was one of the most brilliant businessmen, black or white, in this nation at that time? Really? Did you know that on YouTube there's a, there's a short video in which he's acting yes, so da 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 then the camera could just, in his business voice, could you put that camera there, please? And I would, wow. <laughs> a totally different human being. Mm -hmm. And when I was a young man, I used to come down on him and mm -hmm. Hattie McDaniel, look at their, mm. their sellouts or whatever, until I got into the business mm -hmm. and realized, can you imagine what they faced? What options did they have? And it made me have a totally different respect for them. Hmm. Because in spite of everything, they did the best they could with what they were given. And I think we should respect that. Yeah. Have you thought about doing, I mean, doing a project like that, because that reminds me of, uh, there's a scene in the movie Crash with Terrence Howard. And, uh, uh, and Terrence Howard is directing this, what I believe is a sitcom. And Tony Danza comes up and says, listen, you lead after there, I mean, you know, he's really talking with you proper in some of the words. Can you get him back to the guys? And 
in the beginning of the series, he's got this, so we want that, and Terrence says, what are you, what are you talking about? This is just, and then he, he basically gets in the face and listen, do we have a problem? And Terrence Howard casually doesn't react. He says, okay, we're gonna do this again. And that was his reality in the business. And when you talk about your story, I mean, you didn't have to deal with that per se, but it's mm -hmm. like, that's, you know, one of the things that you might have to deal with when. Well, what, what the, what the um, producer was saying to Terrence's character, um, there's a line of 20 guys out there that want this job. So, uh, what's up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You want to continue because um, I can, all I got to do is push a button and five guys will do what I tell them to do. Hmm. So how do you, I mean, you got a family, you got bills, you got mortgage, you got your college for your kids. and I think that would be an interesting story to tell about um, people's perception of what they consider a salad or what they're really doing. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Yeah. It, it's. I just think that people don't. Under, there's. There's compromises, you know. Yeah. I mean. But what are the compromises you can live with, and those that kill you? That's the whole. Yeah. yeah. And you. You want. You know. You got your boat, and. Um, but you can't sleep. <laughs> right. <laughs> So one of the projects I saw you working on, I believe it's completed, is a series called Fly? No. No? no. It is about uh, black stewardesses. That is what you're credited with. I'm really, credited they're, with they're, a lot of stuff. They're, they're, they're adding <laughs> stuff never on heard the of, Pro about you, apparently. Never heard that one. Yeah. Fly. Yeah, yeah it's mm. called Fly. It's never got a check. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, has your name on it. And you, uh, one of the other, and you've worked with Lawrence Fishburne a couple times. Now. Yes. Um, and one of my favorite movies with him was uh, Hoodlum, where he plays, yes. it, this is in Harlem. Bumpy Johnson. Yes. Bumpy Johnson, which, uh, if this was made after the Cotton Club movie was made, mm -hmm. uh, which he re basically reprised his role as Bumpy Johnson, would you say, or was it, was it just a different. Which one? Well, in the movie The Cotton Club, mm -hmm. Lawrence Fishburne plays. Bumpy Johnson in that, right? But in Hitler, he's reprising that same character in your film. Yes. Um, one of the things I like about the film, other than you know all the great acting, is there are moments of comedy in that that I wouldn't expect. Uh, and I always wonder: is there, these are things that you let happen as a director? Uh, there's a scene where uh, God, uh, the guy that plays Dutch, I think, uh, Tim Roth. Tim yes, Roth. Yes. Yes. Uh, he's 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 meeting with one of his henchmen, and they were talking about price for killing someone, I think. And he says, "What's up with this raise?" And he says, "We live in inflationary times." And then he leaves that meeting, goes to his other meeting. Hey, how's it going? I say, "Yeah, we live in, we live in fucking inflationary times." <laughs> <laughs> it's comical. <laughs> More like, is that something that just kind of happens? I mean, that kind of comedy, I really enjoy what I'm seeing. I think I think it's part of the writing, and you know, but. One of the most wonderful things about filmmaking, I think, is the pre-production. And then those pre-production meetings, we have rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And when the actors get into those characters, mm -hmm. they come up with stuff that I didn't think about, and neither yeah. did the writer, you know? Yeah. And some of them are horrible ideas, but some of them are brilliant. And the ones that are brilliant, you know, you don't say, we can't put that in the movie because I'm the director, I'm the writer. No, 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 no. <laughs> My name still goes <laughs> as the director, yeah. you know, because it's a better idea than what we had. Mm -hmm. And so I welcome that. I really do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So your um, your process for um, directing, I mean, if you want to give a little tidbit for the people that are new and starting out, um, I don't know if you do go into the deep levels of the casting, or do you mainly do the main roles, and you let someone else sort of do figure out the casting mm, for no, supporting no. roles. There's two components to directing. Mm -hmm. um, one is the creative aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a control freak. Um, I'm, my name's going on it. I want to know every element. And so from the uh, script to, who, I'm talking about the extras. Mm -hmm. I want to see the pictures okay. of the people who are the extras. and. Even if I don't audition an actor, we sit down and talk before I hire them about their feeling about the role and so on. It's not an audition. I just want to make sure we're 
in sync with where we're heading, you know. Mm -hmm. um, because once we agree, um, then we have a deal. All right. So then I have to take that vision and translate it to sometimes a hundred or more people, the crew, the cast, the drive. I mean, it's you got to translate. So the creative aspect is very important. But the second part of directing is management. And it's management of three things. And these are it's the most important part of directing. You're managing time, people, and money. Mm -hmm. You can have the most wonderful vision you want. But if you cannot manage time, people, and money, you don't work often. Because you're, you're being entrusted by the network or the studio or an investor with their dollars. Mm -hmm. And so you got to finish on time, ideally, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Now some guys are so famous that they go over. And I, I'm already thinking of Apocalypse Now. The whole, <laughs> you know, but he's uh, by this time he's who he is. But That's he, right. Couple is that guy. So, but, but for the average director, yeah, um, you got to you got to come in on time and on budget and manage a large number of people. So, uh, I, I I encourage directors, you know, of their creative aspects, I say, keep on going, keep on pushing. Yes, you have see it differently, great. But never forget how to manage time, people, and money. Hmm. The, um, we get a lot into the minutia about your selection. You talk about, you know, you look at every people down to the extras, what, they, what do they look like? So what we deal with a lot as an actor and then also the hitter photographer are the things like, okay, well, how do we get the perfect headshot? You know, how do we make it so that everything is technically just so? And we always wonder, I think, do the, does the director and producer really care about that stuff? Is it, are you really caring that, you know, they're holding their hands in their face like this? Do you really care that, um, you know, they, they're, they're washed out in the photo and, you, you know? So kind of give me your take on that whole thing with, when you're looking at photos. Well, I'll say this again, it's called motion pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every picture, every frame tells a story. Mm -hmm. Is the story that frame is telling part of the story arc of the movie? Mm -hmm. Or is it antithetical to that? Okay. So every moment that the character's on screen, whatever he or she does says something about something, about them. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, uh, as long as the actor is in line with that, there's no problem. Mm -hmm. But... Um, it, it, it's like most actors, I think, that, I mean, the ones that I work with anyway are professional to the degree that we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. So if they create something different, it's based upon the same, you know, uh, vision. Um, it's not they going off to the left or something. Um, and, and, and it's for directing, you know, for directors, I mean, we have to understand, again, time, people, and money. If we go on a location scout and the teamster is there and the DP is there mm -hmm. and the first AD is there and um, I say, we're going to shoot this way, the mirror and the TV screen and the bookshelf, that's going to be our background and um, we're shooting on Wednesday and this is say, the week before. Mm. And I come on the set, and I get this inspiration. No, mm -hmm. we're gonna shoot it this way today. Mm -hmm. That means that the Teamsters trucks are parked over there. Right. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we're supposed to shoot this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of young directors, they're just like, my friend just worked with this young lady who's a directing, and he said, man, it lost a lot of money because that's time. She was coming out of inspiration, which is okay. Mm -hmm. But she told everybody they were going to shoot that way. And so the hour and a half that they could have been shooting, they're moving everything around. Right. And that's. Mm -hmm. But some people can do it, and some. I, I just don't think that's the way to do it. That's my feeling. So you don't think those spontaneous moments of inspiration are ultimately. To you. Your, sponta your spontaneity should have happened. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not when a crew is depending on your word. Yeah. And yeah. the cast and everybody else, and you suddenly, oh no, I, 
don't want that. Then you're talking about yourself. You're not talking about the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We, I think I watch that a lot too when I'm watching a lot of projects now is I'm always trying to figure out okay, what's the time schedule? Because I, um, the movie High Flying Bird, a lot of your scenes are in this gym. And, but those scenes happen out of sequence in the final product. So I'm like, okay, so they must have filmed all this in one day. Mm-hmm. There's one scene when you're in the office with uh, Andre Holland and mm-hmm. his, the other woman who plays the director of, mm-hmm. she's like the union director, I think. Yes, and, yes. And uh, that's a different day. You know, and I'm thinking, okay, how many days they have Bill Duke in this <laughs> for this film? Um, uh, but these are parts of time management for a director. And Stephen, you know, he's master of this by now, of course. Listen, um, you're talking about, you know, shooting a scene, there's like five, four or five people in the scene. Mm-hmm. And, you're, and you have five iPhones. Um, you have two sound guys, Labs and Booms. Mm-hmm. And then you have the five iPhones. Five? Yes. One iPhone's getting the master. Uh-huh. Other one's getting over her to you. Huh. At the same time, the other getting your close-up. <laughs> huh. At the same time. Yeah. So that's cutting down your shoot time. Okay, I'm thinking of how that position will work, but I don't know. I've never had a director. That's it, why I me? don't know. <laughs> he, he's brilliant. I mean, yeah. he, he blocks it in such a way. And he says, are you guys comfortable with what I just did? And I said, well, I want to move over here. Okay, there's no problem. You, you, that, you're con- that's good, right? Hmm. Boom. Bang, 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 boom. Hmm. So that's another question, too, is as a director, you have to sort of make the decision. You want to trust your actors to where you want them to do the scene, and you want to work around capturing that scene. Is that kind of it, or is it you well, have a scene in mind? Well, I, I, I have a vision in mind of how I right. want it to go, mm-hmm. as long as they're comfortable within that context. Okay. I, I, don't, I never want to do something that makes the actor uncomfortable to the degree where his performance is impacted. Mm-hmm. Because he's not giving his thousand percent, he has to be, or she has to be comfortable with what we're doing. Because it's, you know, it's it's a collaboration. It's not maybe directing is the wrong term because you are in charge of the production, mm-hmm. but it's a collaboration because if you have an idea and you're rehearsing in pre-production and the actor comes up with something that you did not think of. You have to, you know something? That tells a story better than what I have. My ego doesn't get in the way and say, well, no, I, mm-hmm. you've got to do it like this. That's, mm-hmm. I think there's something a little insane about that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's, it's surrendering to the creative process. Yeah. I, I admire actors because I don't think people, it shouldn't be called acting. It should be called being, mm-hmm. the art of being, because, okay, you, you memorize your lines, and then you get on stage or you get in front of the camera. If you're just saying your lines without hearing what you're saying, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what you're saying, I'm going to say my lines exactly how I memorize them, why are you there? Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's flat and empty. What? Why are you there? That's called stage fright because mm-hmm. you said, I'm going to do it this way. But at a certain point when you're working on a character, there's a time of surrender. You surrender to something It's hard to explain um, that you don't even know what it is in acting, after the lines are there, something happens. You know, the character starts to speak to you. It's, it has characteristics. You don't even know where it comes from. Mm-hmm. And when I'm teaching young people acting, I say you have to treat it like falling into darkness backward. You just fall and trust. And if you're not trusting and you're saying, I'm going to say it angry. Yeah, get back into that house. On the tenth take, get back into that house. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, 
And you, even if there's nobody there, you can still say, get back into the house. And the same way, there's something flat about that. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying, it's, 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 it's an ongoing creative process. Acting. Yeah, yeah, you talk about that too, as far as one of the things you like to do with preparation is you will you'll work to memorize your lines, but you'll work, you'll work it out. You're working out, rehearsal is you working out everything, but not defining how the how it's going to go once you're on set, once you're ready to go. So you, I think you say, well, you you know, do that to, to memorize your lines, but when you get in that moment, let that be the moment and be engaged in that moment and not memorize a preconceived moment, I think is what you're, what you're trying to say with that. Yeah, it's, it's we, we, the actors and myself agree upon who this character is, mm -hmm. what they're about. With the writer, we all have that one collaborative understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and then, before we shoot, uh, we will have um, a day where we go to each set, a day or two. And I let them feel out, you know, okay, where are you comfortable here? Where's the comfort zone? And my DP is with me then too. And so he's watching or she's watching, okay, it's gonna be here, you're sure. I said to the actor, you, you said you're gonna be here, right? So the day that we shoot, mm -hmm. no change, right? No, I like it right here. And um, so the day that we shoot, that's what we do. Because mm -hmm. we don't. Lights change. Mm -hmm. Everything goes over, and I, when I say light changes, you know, the network or the studio does not calculate how much each hour costs, but each second. Oh. Yeah. So, we can't, I mean, we can be creative to a certain extent, but once we have a verbal agreement yeah. through collaboration, we have to do that. Yeah. I think I learned too there's fundamental differences as far as directing a feature film versus directing a network series. There's, and I didn't know this for years as an actor is when you go, <clears throat> the directors come in, there's a show that's established and they have the directors that rotate in. And they have a certain look and feel of that show. That's right. That as a director you're required to kind of keep to. That's right. But do they say you can add your little personal but you got to keep to this or how does it as work when you're doing that kind of thing? As long as your creative process is within the context of the look of that show, mm -hmm. um, the actors and what their experience is with each other, um, there's a style to each show. Right. And so if you can be creative within that context, there's no problem. You can't just come in and change the style. Right. And no. You can't go ahead and make Dallas suddenly look like Beretta. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to work. Right. <laughs> but you, 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 it's, it's a lucrative job. It's a great job. Um, but you're within a context that's been created previously. Yeah. On a, the feature, no context has been created. So you're the one who... You create... Okay. Right. Visually, you know, you create everything in terms of the pace, the mood, the whatever. You are in charge of that. Mm. And that's, it's great freedom. Mm. Great freedom. How do you, because uh, I have a lot of director friends that try to ask, how do you get into that rotation of directors? And I think it's just sort of, you know, you have some experience on one project and you could ask them one thing or two and then suddenly they're like, hey, you're the guy they can call on to jump in and direct. An episode of NCIS or direct an episode of uh, you know Big Bang, whatever these shows are. You know, you, it's no like, kind of like application process. You can't just apply the job. I think you've got to know someone, isn't that? Well, it's that too. Uh, ideally speaking, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but also like in foster care um, in our business, there's an aging out process. Mm. Uh, I, I I created a metaphor for it. I'm looking. I'm, I'm not complaining because I'm still working. Thank right. God. <laughs> uh, but um, it's a four-step uh, metaphor. Okay. Um, step number one. I use my own name, but it applies to I think the business. Step number one. Who's Bill Duke? Mm. Step number two. You gotta get me Bill Duke. 
Step number three. Can you find me a younger Bill Duke? <laughs> Step number four. Who's Bill Duke? <laughs> really? Really? Yes. Really? <laughs> With few exceptions. Huh. With few exceptions. Huh. There are some exceptions. But for the average director and or actor or whatever, mm -hmm. um, as you get older, um, there's a conception that, a perception, that you're no longer able to do what you did 10 years ago. Hmm. And that's not always the case. It depends on how you take care of yourself, mentally, physically, and spiritually, and that you even know more, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because you've refined what you've... Yeah, that's what I would... But awesome. the, the industry does not see it that way. They want a new energy or something like that. Mm -hmm. and so, But it's okay, you know, just have to deal with it. Yeah. Would you say that applies to actors and extent as well? Not just directors, but that same metaphor of oh, yeah, actors. It's, it's, but you know, for all actors, but for women, it's, it's the worst. Um, um, 15 years ago, 10 years, 15 years ago, I had a friend, she was a great actress on Broadway and, uh, you know, in New York, and she traveled the, world, the country with you know, her plays and everything. She wanted to get in the film business. And I was telling my buddy who worked over at Universal, I said, man, you got to see this lady, man. She's, she's incredible. And, uh, okay, so she came to L.A. one day and got an appointment to go and see him. And um, I said, how'd the interview go? She says, I guess, I don't know. I, I hope it went okay. So she went back to New York and hadn't heard from my buddy. I called him a couple of times. And I guess he was busy. And then uh, one day he says, come to my office. Went to his office, I said, well, how, how is she? She said, she's a really wonderful actress. And um, only one problem. I said, what is it? He said, she's um, 34. I said, what does that mean? And I'm literally telling you what he said. He said, for women in this business, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, with few exceptions. Hmm. And then he said to me, um, let me give you an example. Harrison Ford could be in a movie, mm -hmm. and he's the lead. He could have a female love interest in her late 30s. He said, and Harrison Ford was in his 70s at that time. He said, other than Mer Meryl Streep, name me one female actress in this business in her 70s that could have a love interest in his 30s. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a real thing. Yeah. And, and um, you know, it really woke me up because I know some very, very, very talented women that I think should be working every day. After a certain age, mm -hmm. hmm. zero. Hmm. Now, there are exceptions. Tavia Butler and other people and white actresses, too. Mm -hmm. There are exceptions, but... I'm talking about the overall industry and how yeah. women women are perceived and how yeah. it's 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 not the same because it's not the same. For, I mean, for some men, you know, but hmm. it's not the exact same thing. Yeah. Does that make any sense? It, no, that it that, doesn't make any sense, but <laughs> it's true. But that I think that kind of <laughs> gives some other wind, other side to this this thing where people are getting a lot all the work done, particularly females, to get work done all the time in Hollywood because they're trying to stay or try their best to be perceived within that window all the time. But you know, Joan Rivers, you know, the comedian? Mm -hmm. I loved her. She was one of the funniest people and she had so much work done, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she went on Johnny Carson one day and she's, Johnny says, Joan Rivers! And she sat down and she said, Johnny, am I smiling? <laughs> <laughs> She 
no longer knew. She didn't know anymore. No. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Peggy, you've uh, thoroughly researched and read through. Well, the book. you know, I, 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 I get accused of talking all the time, and I just want to point out that, that, that I didn't talk a lot in this job. one. I just want, I want recognition for that. Yeah. <laughs> because this was very enjoyable. This was, this was, I just have one question I sure. want to ask. Now, you know, you're an amazing actor and an amazing director. How is it to act under another director? I mean, is, is you're just, it, that's not my job today, and so you go in. Is, is there ever, you know, Never. is it ever weird or nothing? It's just always a... Well, um, I try to work with directors who um, want to have respect for actors. Mm -hmm. And it's collaboration. And they know what they're doing, you know, and the story, the script is... A great script, you right. know. That's my preference. Um, but early in my career, I, you know, and, and when, when I'm acting, I don't direct. And I'm, I'm an actor, right? And I don't talk to the director about anything other than my character. Mm -hmm. um, that's called respect. But I worked with a director, a young director, like 20 years ago, and I was having trouble with my the scene because it, I didn't quite understand why the character did what he did at this particular time because it was inconsistent mm -hmm. with the history of the character. Mm -hmm. And so I said, hey Frank, you know, can you help me with this um, because I don't, I'm, I'm getting stuck. And he took a breath and paused and he said, hmm, yeah, I can help you. He says, make it more blue. Hmm. <laughs> that was his note for you. <laughs> this was 20 years ago. I still don't understand <laughs> yeah. what that meant. Huh. Um, but um, so, but there are great directors like um, Steven Sodenberg, uh, John McTiernan, um, a lot of great ones, man. That when you're working with them, mm -hmm. they work with you, mm -hmm. and you know you can. You feel safe. You feel okay. Good, good, good. They got my back. And that's the ones I like to work with. Yeah. My, my dad always said, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. Always. And uh, I think that's the thing. And in, in, in when you're in a creative business, if you can surround yourself with, with people that are smarter than you, all they do is make you look smart. <laughs> You know, so so traveling in a good group um, with great directors and great actors, I think, is is uh, also a key to success. You know, finding no finding that that niche. But also, suppose we're at lunch, you know, and the and the, and the craft service guy says, "Mr. Duke, um, you know, you know, the last time that car went past us, the license plate on the back was straight, but now it's crooked and it's not going to match." I don't say, you're the craft service guy. Exactly. I'm, <laughs> I'm the director. You say, oh my God, thank you. I say, thank you very much. Nice. And I tell the guys to straighten the license plates out because my name still goes on as director. Yeah. I don't exactly. put him down. Exactly. No. But some people's, people throw phones in people's faces and all kinds of other... For no, there's no reason. I can understand their frustration, but you don't take it out on other human beings. You, know? mm -hmm. you don't do that. No. So with your long experience, we get a lot of actors ask questions about things, and one of their main questions is about starting out in the industry. A lot of times you run into actors um, that I think their question is, okay, so I'm just getting into acting, so I want to be in movies, so what do I do? And, <laughs> and my expression is always that. And uh, so, from, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what are your what, what kind of advice do you have for young actors starting out or wanting to start out? Learn the craft of acting. Number one, mm -hmm. it's a craft. It's a craft. It's something that the great ones, you know, I, you know, I, I one of my favorite movies is Sophie's Choice, Meryl Streep, many, 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 many years ago, and. When I saw that movie, and she was at the train station, and the Nazi guard said, 
okay, get on the train, and she gets ready to go to the train. She says, no, no, no. Only two people. Mm-hmm. She has her son and daughter there, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And he, he, she says, okay, let my kids go. And he says, no, no, no. An adult has to accompany. Mm-hmm. You want the son or the daughter? Mm-hmm. And to look what she, at her, not only as an actress, but as a human being, went through at that moment. Mm-hmm. Powerful. Just, because it made you think, if I was in a situation, and I had to choose who lived, my son or my daughter, I'm willing to sacrifice my life, but they won't let me. Mm-hmm. What do you do? And, um, I'm a big fan of her to this day. I don't care yeah. what she does. I, because she doesn't care how she looks on screen. If the character says that she's 85 mm-hmm. and they want to see her stomach stick out with rolls, no problem. I got rolls and I'm 85. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's fearless, man. And and those are the actors. I mean, just you know, just great work. You know, it's just I want to be like them when I grow up. Put it that way. Yeah. So we appreciate your book very much. This is uh, your latest book. Yes. Which I noticed in here, it's not just a lot of your life story, but you also you know, sneak in a lot of poetry in there too. Yes. Nick. <laughs> yes. And I really appreciate that as well. Have you thought about just having a book of just poetry? I'm or? working right, on, as we say, I'm, 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 I have a children's book called The Journey and uh, a book of poetry that I'm putting together of my poems I've written over the last... 40 years or so Mm -hmm. I'm putting those together now and trying to find a publisher that will really um, understand what I'm doing and you know continuing you know you guys like quotes yes I love quotes quotes. can I give my favorite for you absolutely anonymous aspire to inspire before you expire (laughs) Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Number two, anonymous. If a man does not seek humility, humility will seek the man. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, my favorite, in your lifetime, you will never see a smaller package than a person wrapped up in themselves. Right. Good stuff. So true. <laughs> Ah. So um, I'm going to put links down below um, so that people can click on it. How do they find out more about your foundation? Uh, they go to the Duke Media Foundation.org. Well, oh, that's the one. Duke Media Foundation.org. Duke Media Foundation.org. And um, also, I want to say this um, some people have come to me and um, they want to. Uh, sponsor for me a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Oh, nice. Yes. Absolutely. You don't have one yet? No, 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 I don't. <laughs> and, uh, so Robert Walker, you can go to his site okay. online, and Robert Walker is raising funds, and he's also putting together collaborations so it could possibly happen. So, And it wasn't my idea. He just came to me and said, Bill, I think you deserve a star. And right. For the last almost year, he's been working with me, and it's, it's, been, it's been great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think most people don't know that, that. I think the requirement is you've got to have a fan club sponsor your star. Mm-hmm. Like you, you, know, you can't just pay for it as any of us would. Yes. You've got to have a fan club sponsor mm-hmm. put it up. And they have to approve it over a period of time. Yeah. So yeah. we're in the process of it being approved possibly, but he's raising funds and also. So I'm a very extremely appreciative to him for doing that. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Yeah, Sneak absolutely. Sneak up to Halloween Highland and catch that. Yes. <laughs> 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 great. Yeah. Well, that's fine. That's great. Well, again, thank you for, for talking you know, to I us. Want, I want to thank you so much. It was great. Thank Both you. Both great questions and great show. Well, thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate it. So, um, get, on, get on Amazon and buy his book. Um, find out more about his foundation and find out more about this uh, star on Hollywood, mm-hmm. uh, Walk of Fame. Mm-hmm. I'm excited <laughs> about that. Um, Most importantly, you guys have a great week and I'll see you next week.
Thank you so much. Thank you. That was really Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really great. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. It was fun. I will be here all day with you about the stuff you've been. Oh, yeah. So he, uh, I'm he, glad yeah. I'm here for a bit.